so you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not beautiful enough, feminine enough, or masculine enough. And definitely, you are not worthy enough. So now that we've established that this room is full of unworthy, stupid, and ugly people, <laughs> we can have a chat. Now let's also imagine that your children. How did that feel? As children, what we want is to play, to be free, to laugh. But there's one moment when everything changes. Something we do makes us come face to face with a new concept. You are not enough. You can test that and ask yourselves, what was the first time someone told you that you were lousy at singing? Or that you were too short to play basketball? Or that you had no talent for drawing? Well, my mother says that I came out of her womb with a pencil and paper in my hand, and that I used to draw until I fell asleep, which is why I had very few friends. <laughs> but actually, the truth is that, unlike most of the boys in my class, I preferred to play with girls. I was more comfortable, they were more fun. <laughs> it's true, I... So I didn't think anything of it, right? Until I heard a word that I had never heard before. It started like a thunder that got closer and louder to me as it exploded like egg in my face. Maricon. <laughs> Faggot. Well, I didn't really understand that word at first, but the word was here to stay for years. A little known book uh, you might know as the Bible starts with, in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. So after failed attempts to fight against this word and try to make friends, my only option was to make friends with white sheets of paper. Paper would not shout or kick me. Paper was kind. And on paper, everything, anything was possible. Just like in the movies. Have you ever wondered what your life would be like if it was a movie? Well, my life is a movie for sure. I mean, <laughs> you know, it has music, editing, production value, special effects, and tons of internal dialogue. The moment the world tells you you're not enough and you believe it is when your life starts to become a movie. As best-selling author of The Four Agreements, Don Manuel Ruiz wrote, the same way that you are the main character in your story, you're only a secondary character in everybody else's story. Think about it. In my story, you guys are a sea of faces in this beautiful theater. But in your story, I'm not even a secondary character. I'm just an extra. <laughs> and I have never played an extra, okay? <laughs> well, maybe once. <laughs> in my personal movie, the main character was this sad kid who suffered. I mean, so the only comfort I had was to, f to uh, sketch. Keep sketching, keep sketching. You know, it's like Nemo, keep swinging, keep swimming. <laughs> because it was the only thing that my bullies could not fight against. Every time I, dr I started drawing, they would, they would leave me alone. They would shut up for a moment. So after experiencing this for a while, a few times, I thought, ooh, do I have a superpower? I mean, it was evident that with this superpower, I could get a tiny little bit of respect. And as a result of tasting that respect, of feeling, you know, a certain kind of acceptance, well, I loved it. It was like a drug. I wanted more of it. I became an addict 
of acceptance. And at age 12, you know, I saw that the hormones were going kind of crazy around my, my schoolmates. And so I hatched a plan to get even more respect and acceptance. I started animating cartoon porn. <laughs> and little, you know, little, little flip books. You know, the <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it was Buenos Aires, 1990. There was no internet. No free porn sites to look at, so. So anyway, you know, um, soon my enemies became my loyal customers. Yeah, I was selling these works of art, okay? I was a cartoon porn producer at 12 and I loved it, yeah. So that's when I became an artist. <laughs> Acceptance was my fuel. And when that is the case, like an addict, you do whatever it takes to get a fix. 25 drawings for one second. <laughs> so in order to please others, what do you do, really? You change. I figured that if I changed my faggot self, I could be in. I hated that word so much that I spent years perfecting myself to become a very convincing little actor. I was desperate to fit in. I wanted to know what it was like to be part of life or if there were other people out there like me. And so, at age 17, a girl from school tells me of a scholarship to finish the last two years of high school in this weird place called the United World College. <laughs> At the other, on the other side of the world, in Italy, of course I applied, Are you kidding me? <laughs> and so, I failed terribly at all the written exams, but, but in a stroke of luck, magic happened. We as a group of applicants were asked a question, a trick question. If we told you that you had to go to the airport right now without saying goodbye to your families, who would go? <laughs> I was the only one who raised the hand. I got the scholarship. Well, that day I realized that there was a God and he was listening to me. <laughs> and at the United World College, well, I was able to befriend other freaks like me. <laughs> it was beautiful, it was amazing. And it was there among the freaks that I stepped on a stage for the very first time. When I sang the first lines to Summer Lovin' from Greece, Electricity coursed through my whole body. I mean, it felt amazing, you know? And now I became an addict of something new. Adrenaline, applause. Now I wasn't just the protagonist of my life. Now I was the protagonist of a musical. <laughs> so, having established that we are the protagonist of our lives, we, we can be dramatic, can't we? If something, hap if something bad happens to us, right? We think that nothing like that has ever happened to anyone in the history of man, ever. So, after the Freaks College, I find myself in London as a starving dance student. But I get a job at the Royal Opera House in an opera. Yeah, I was an extra. <laughs> As an extra dancer, okay? So, first day of rehearsals, uh, the director looks at me up and down and says, I need an actor to be fully naked in the show. If you're up to it, we'd pay you more than the others. How much more? 
a hundred more a week. A hundred pounds? That's so much more. That means tuna in my pasta. <laughs> that means, uh, you know, a chocolate bar after dinner. That means going to the cinema and eating popcorn. <laughs> yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I do the rehearsals wearing clothes. And as the day of the technical rehearsal approaches, well, I'm feeling a little worried. But even though the thought of having my sausage exposed to an opera house was daunting, by the technical rehearsal, I'm feeling a little better about it. You know, a little cocky, a little confident, a little liberated. Also, it was only for three seconds during, you know, the main note of the tenor singing his aria. Bah! It was quick. It was easy. So, a few days later, um, I'm on my way to college. Beautiful music, isn't there? <laughs> uh, a few days later, I'm on my way to college on the tube. And as I reach my stop, the doors open up to reveal this huge poster immortalizing those three seconds <laughs> of my pee pee floating in the wind <laughs> and promoting Rigoletto at the Royal Opera House. Well, you know, I was, I was happy to be on a poster, <laughs> but I was horrified to be on that poster. I mean, ugh. You know, I, I was mad that nobody asked me, and that day in the theater, I was not camera ready. It was freezing, okay? <laughs> uh, and you know what? Worst of all, I went right back to that place of shame I felt as a first grader. Maricón. Only now it was Maricón with his pee-pee out. <laughs> so in that moment, I really believed that nothing like that had ever happened to anyone in the history of mankind, ever. We humans are all critics, aren't we? We come up with stories in our minds all day long. We believe them. For some of us, we are the hero. For others, the victim. And for most of us, we are a mixture of both. The critic comes up with the most intricate articles about ourselves and we listen. The critic is the voice of judgment. But is it our own judgment? Or is the critic just trying to make sense of the world? And just like a real film critic, they tell us how to improve the movie by criticizing it. What I find comical and tragic at the same time is that I went and chose a career that is all about perception, exposure, judgment, about not being right for the part or not being good enough. Ah, there it is again. So what cynical mind would choose a passion that exposes you to all the things that scare you the most? Yes, I think we can all say that sometimes we are masochists, right? <laughs> but the actual answer to that question is simple for me is the electricity. Many years later, um, I'm working in a home for people with learning difficulties in London, where I meet a man called Philip. Philip uh, had autism, and you know he ha he's huge. He has this very sort of stern look in his face, and he scares the crap out of me. And one day, I'm helping him with his cooking. And uh, I notice that he is insulting himself under his breath, saying, stupid, idiot, bastard. It was, it was jarring to see this huge man sort of abuse himself over and over. So I started to coax him into conversation so that he would, you know, his mind would go elsewhere. And one day, I asked him if he'd ever been to the theater. And he said no. So, without telling my boss, of course, I took him to the Richmond Theater where a Latvian dance company was doing Swan Lake. 
And with his disability discount, we buy two tickets. <laughs> and we sit down, we take our seats, the curtain goes up, the lights go down, and I check on Philip to see if he's doing okay. He's okay. The dancers appear, the ballet starts, and I hear shuffling. It's Philip. He's uncomfortable. Ugh. And as the music swells, Philip starts to cry. Oh no. Philip, uh, do you want to go to the bathroom? We could go to the bathroom. It's okay, we can go to the bathroom. But he's not moving, and now he is crying louder. And I freak out. I am so sorry, Philip. We should not have come here. Let's just go. But he won't move, and he's sobbing now, really loud. And people around us shush us. And I know for a fact that I'm going to get fired. Philip, what is it? What's wrong with you? And with tears in his eyes and a look of puzzlement in his face, he says, I'm happy. Philip had never seen anything like that in his entire life. And just like myself at the United World College, he experienced the electricity, that undescribable thing we call beauty or art or connection. They say that artists are people who taste the juice of life at that crystalline moment when they let their creative spirit out and touch someone else's heart. That at that moment, they're closer to God. I believe that. Philip was taken by surprise. I mean, the voice in his mind, the bully, could not speak because something beautiful was happening to him. And at that moment, when I saw that reaction, it was like seeing a mirror to my own story. Then and there, I decided that I would dedicate my life to one day do what those performers had done for Philip. I saw the world through Philip's eyes, and phew, I loved that world. In that place, there was only love. There was no self-punishment, no fear. And there was definitely no judgment. And when we don't judge, we tell better stories. The stories we are actually meant to tell. Many years later, and still justifying my being gay with my critic, I get offered the role of a lifetime. Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, you know... Of all the people in the world that could play this part, they gave it to me. So there I am, hanging on the cross <laughs> in Morocco. And I look up at the sky and I think, you could still strike me down with lightning. <laughs> Are you sure you want me? to play your son, me. It's your time. I waited, nothing happened. I was not struck by lightning. Instead, what I felt was an overwhelming feeling of love and acceptance and freedom that I could never even put into words. A message from God, maybe. Words are like universes, and we are magicians who can create universes with them. We may not abuse ourselves like Philip did, but we do it, yes, we do it softly in increments. It might not seem like abuse at all. It might be a little bit of disappointment here, a little shame there, but over time it becomes a very convincing script, and it destroys as much as it did for Philip. Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So, to you I say, why don't we fire that critic and become the author of our lives? I could, I could tell the same stories, but I know that one day when I see the light at the end of the tunnel, I will ask myself, was it worth telling that faggot story over and over again? Who are you trying to convince of that plot? 
Did that narrative serve my higher purpose? Did you enjoy the movie? Or would you have preferred to tell a different story? In the words of David Bowie, always go a little further into the water than you feel you're capable of. And when you feel that your feet aren't quite touching the bottom, you're just about in the right place to do something exciting. Today, as I'm giving this talk, my feet are definitely not touching the bottom. You are all more than good enough. You are all brilliant and unique authors. You're, in fact, artists, all of you. So let's make this life a masterpiece of art. And when you're aware that you're screwing up your own movie, change it. Thank you.